And so as we become a digital species, which I think is inevitable, I just hope that we keep an eye on our bodies. And you, you've seen probably this, this future, uh, not cypherpunk, but solar punk. And I'm not super deep in this. It's essentially a future vision that merges high tech society with nature. The, the, the images are like beautiful, super advanced cities with like food growing right on the outside of the buildings. And our communal spaces are technologically enabled, but there's trees and plants everywhere. And so I, I don't know enough about that vision, but to me, that makes the most sense. We can't neglect our body as far as I know, and we're going to become a network species because it provides all these amazing tools. But if we neglect our body, we're gonna pay the consequence. And so let, let's build a solar punk future. But I would point to the fact that these education institutions, the state education, that was never supposed to give you a great free thinking, critical thinking, li classically liberal education. These were more or less daycare institutions or uh, obedience school training for an industrial era. Right. And so the foundation of these things were never built like that. And so I think we're just sort of realizing that they don't serve us anymore. And we're sort of fighting that system. And I don't know exactly what the future of education will be, but it's not what we're doing right now. And so I wouldn't waste any more energy trying to fix the old system. If you're the type of person who has young people or you're concerned about this, instead, look to the future. What is what do you want education to be? Because we have an opportunity now to completely start over. And this, this might be some sort of homeschooled um, type training, or maybe it's small neighborhoods where each kid, maybe there's 10 families and one day a week, the kids go to a different person's house for social time. And then they learn through their computer. And I'm not sure what the future looks like, but forget the old stuff, build new. And to me, that's very optimistic. I'm super passionate about education uh, and learning in general. And so I would say after Bitcoin is boring, Let's say, let's say we, we get Bitcoin to a point where we're not needed as much, it's not that exciting, it's just money now, then I think education would be a place I could see myself spending time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I haven't thought enough about this because I think it's a, the next thing that I care about. But yeah, I guess my too long didn't read is don't worry about the old one and build a new one. Hey, how are you all doing? My name is Kevin Davani. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. What can we expect? Civil war, more civil wars, total war, hyperinflationary events, deadly totalitarianism, regional conflicts. Um, you know, there's a bunch of negative things we could talk about, but um, really pleased and announced to have Brenton Quidham back on my show talking in connection with his latest masterpiece, Bitcoin and, and the Rhythms of History, based on the book, The Fourth Turning, which I haven't re uh, read yet, but I'm planning to do. So we're going to talk about a bunch of things. I've made four pages of notes, but I'm going to let him do the talking. And um, and yeah, you know, uh, what's going to happen to all the debt and, you know, the central banks, the governments, more surveillance, more militarization of police, uh, you know, more oppression, attacks against encryption. We're going to talk about freedom, individualism, prosperity, abundance, uh, deflationary economics, and uh, what you know? How how are these events going to unfold? Uh, is Bitcoin the fourth turning, or is it a totally new, you know, totally in itself uh, evolutionary turning point? So these are other questions. Without further ado, this is my cosmic talk conversation with Brandon Krim. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Please give it a like. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you love this interview. Please give it a five star review on any podcast platform. Make sure you retweet it, share it, and follow me on Twitter and also Brandon Quidham on Twitter. And I'm going to put everything in the show notes. Thank you so much again for support, for listening. Here you go, my talk with Brandon Quidham. Welcome to the show, to the Total Bitcoin Podcast show. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm really excited to have Brenton Quidham back on my show again after, you know, we have been talking together, I think, uh, with uh, Hess McCook. I think that was la our last session. So, Brenton, thanks so much. And how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Excited to be back. Look, I know you are, you know, you don't need much introduction, but, you know, I know you as a, as a writer, as a brilliant writer, author, speaker, you're, you you know, self-made entrepreneur, a passionate and cosmic Bitcoiners, I would call you. 
uh, and you're all, I know there's an update. I think you are sort of, a, I don't know what you're building, what you're doing exactly at Swan Bitcoin, you know, the one and only Bitcoin only auto DCA platform. Uh, is there anything I missed? Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, my professional background started, um, I ran a newspaper, then I, then I sold enterprise software for Oracle for four years. Then I spent four years uh, building lifestyle businesses, essentially uh, business skills for entrepreneurs, uh, wellness entrepreneurs. And then my wife and I spent four years backpacking during that time, traveling around the world and working remote, sort of like a four hour work week inspired digital nomad type mission. And then found Bitcoin in 2017, uh, re-architected career around that, as many of us seem to do. And yeah, dabbled in the industry a few different places and found myself in Swan um, end of 2019, early 2020. And then now what I do there mainly is email marketing stuff. But it's a bit of uh, content, marketing, conversion, um, onboarding our customers, communication, writing. It's kind of just... Swan's kind of a content business that helps people learn about Bitcoin and at the same time is the easy way for them to onboard uh, through the auto DCA. And so we view ourselves as a media or a content business and that's my, my sweet spot. And so, yeah, get to work with an amazing team there and yeah, Swan, uh, <laughs> Swan number go up. Our customers are growing exponentially as many people, as many businesses are in the industry right now. And so I, I wake up excited every day to work with the Swan team. Uh, we're on Slack late at night due to uh, personal preference, not because we need to. And so it feels like a, a good squad there. And yeah, we're building something special, I think. Yeah, you're a great team. You're really complimenting one another. And you know, to, uh, I know also uh, GG also has, have, has joined your team pretty much recently, I guess. Uh, so yeah, you, you guys are doing great work, you know, great educational work also. You're constantly present, you know, on the internet uh, or, uh, you know, YouTube or uh, educational material, the interviews, you have high, like super guests on. So it's really great what you're doing. And I think, um, you know, everything is like coming together. It's like all the factors that are necessary for, you know, critical adoption rate or what have you. Okay, let's talk about your article, man. Uh, you you know, your, your previous article was sort of as an intersection, which I really love, you know, about uh, Bitcoin and mycelium. Is it pronounced mycelium or mycelium? Uh, yeah, most people pronounce it mycelium. Yeah, because mycelium. my German is my native tongue, so sometimes I bring it, you know, I confuse it. So, listen, I have like four pages of, of notes and comments and questions, but let's just zoom out. And what are you trying to do with the... Um, the um, the, your you know brilliant article um, Bitcoin and the Rhythms of History, which as I understand is based on this book uh, The Fourth Turning, and I want to talk to you about you know which which really shocked me because it, you mentioned that in the article about a video that Neil Howe, one of the authors uh, of Fourth Turning, made explaining why he is bearish or negative on Bitcoin long term, and it really shocked me because I thought you know, uh, and that was like 2017, and if he had said that like. A little bit like years earlier, you know, I would have understood that. But anyway, what were you trying to say? What's the purpose? What is the essence of an article? What are you trying to like to to like to communicate to, to to your audience? Yeah, good question. So, as you mentioned, Neil Howe and William Strauss, who's now deceased, uh, are the two authors of a book called The Fourth Turning, and they also wrote uh, about five other books, Generations. Um, I'm blanking on the other names, but they're essentially historians or demographers, so studying the demographic trends. And what they found through a very long career of looking into this stuff is that there's surprisingly some repeatable patterns that continue to show up in Western civilization. And so what they did was they just built a framework around these demographic cycles. They gave some things names and they uh, sort of gave us a framework that now we can use as individuals to sort of place ourselves in deep history. And I think it's useful because uh, for many reasons, but one, because humans seem to have this recency bias. And so whatever is going on in the economy today, it's always uh, viewed against, let's say the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, right? Or we, we get stuck in our little ways and we think it's just gonna continue in its linear path because we look just to the recent past. But if you zoom out a little bit more, um, it seems like society grows in, the, in a wave function. There's periods when we're going up, there's periods where we're going down, and that could mean for any variable, 
It could be things like our supply and demand for order, like how much do we trust institutions? Or it could be, how are we raising children? Or are we more individualistic or more collectivist? Is we have high civic engagement or low civic engagement? So all these different forces, they seem to oscillate. And you could think of it like a pendulum, uh, but I think another analogy that I heard from Balaji Srinivasan is it's more like a corkscrew. And so the corkscrew is, is making this circular pattern, but it's actually going up. And I think that's mostly true for civilization. We mostly trend up. Now there are periods like the dark ages or something where it's pretty easy to argue that we regress for quite a period of time, but I think generally we're improving. And so that, that's kind of how I see this. It's a framework. It uses demography, demographics, and these are very deep in the human stack, emergent properties that we observe. And so I think that they're quite fundamental to how humans organize, at least in the West. And why I think that's important today and why I wrote this article is because I, wrote, I read the book um, earlier this year, maybe about a year ago, something like that. And then all of a sudden 2020 happens and things are getting strange. And it's almost like, uh, everything's all happening at once. People are confused. I'm reevaluating re my life, my career, my family. What am I doing here? And through that, I found that this fourth turning thesis was a pretty useful framework. The things that were predicted, uh, the book was written in the 90s. And so all those predictions or roughly those predictions are all coming true now. And so I thought this gave me some uh, sturdier ground or at least a lens to view the current situation. And so, yeah, I wanted to publish that. It's about a 10,000 word essay on, on my website, brandyquidem.com. And Bitcoin actually plays nicely into that, which I'm sure we'll get to uh, at some point in this interview. Um, so that's sort of the overarching framework. And to put us in context today, we're right in the middle of this, the end of this 90 year cycle. So that's kind of the cycle they observed. It started in 1945, right after World War II. Then we go through this period of general peacetime, strong institutions, low inequality. We just finished a war, we're sick of fighting and everything's pretty solid in the 50s. And then you enter the 60s and 70s and the baby boomers who were born in that perfect boring, sterile condition, they sort of rebel against their parents and that creates the consciousness revolution. And that's a, a reaching for culture and interior life. And it, it's sort of a high of individualism. And then we go into the third turning. So that's the second turning. The third turning would be like the 80s, uh, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. That's a period of deregulation of high individualism, increasing crime. And it's sort of like, yeah, the society is starting to, to decay, but there's not really any real problems. And so nobody talks about the problems. The getting's good. Nobody's worried about it. And then you transition into the fourth turning. So that's the final stage of the four stages in these 80 to 90 year cycles. And that was started in 08, 09. And this is a period uh, he calls the crisis. This is when the exterior world starts to fall apart. We organize and we collectivize and then we rebuild. And historically, these, 40, these fourth turnings, again, every 80 to 90 years, they end in total war. So the previous one was World War II. Before that, the Civil War. Before that, the American Revolution. And so like clockwork, these things keep coming up. And so we're, right, we're about halfway through the fourth turning now. I believe we haven't hit the climax yet. And so uh, we're looking to things like total war, civil war. Uh, black swan or terrorist type event or financial collapse, which leads to some sort of conflict. So I believe something like that's on the horizon and you can kind of feel culture accelerating right now. Everyone's aware and most people aren't sure really how to put a finger on it, but um, that's where we are. And we're going to have a period of increasing collectivism. Uh, this is evidenced by things like cancel culture, uh, which is really just a, a response mechanism for society trying to create social consensus, a collectivist vision of the future. So if you're not beating, you're not marching to the, the populist collectivist drum, you're shunned, you're kicked out. There's no room for different, different opinions because we have a big thing to deal with right now. I mean, everyone on board, you're either with us or you're against us. Um, and I, cancer culture is repulsive. I think it's horrible mob, mob mentality. But I, if you look at it through this angle, it is just a defense mechanism trying to get people to make change. And so, um, yeah, I, I guess that's probably enough to start with. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, that's awesome uh, overview. Um, so, Bren, um, is this about like 
also like pred predictability. Like I, I, I didn't read this book. I read, you know, the sovereign individual, but is this something like where, you know, all kinds of elements uh, interplay or, or converge on one another. And then you can somehow, um, you know, make a rhyme or rhythm. You can, you can somehow derive or, or, or de deduce like a rhythm out of it and then foresee, not foresee the future, but somehow, uh, 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 you know, uh, Make a prognosis on 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 a on a relative uh, development into the future. Uh, is this like? Is there like what I want to ask you? Uh, um, I think my point is: Is there anything which has not been handled or dealt with in the book where you say, where you would say, okay, this has come so it's such an exogenous factor; it has come from nowhere. You know, I'm just thinking of, for example, technological innovation. Would that be something that you know the authors of the book haven't really like uh, thought it through, and maybe they don't understand, you know, the real huge potential evolutionary potential of Bitcoin? Yeah, good question. So, first to address predictability, I would say that this thesis is zoomed way out. These are slow glacial trends observable in generations. So he would say the millennials are the hero archetype. We come of age during this fourth turning, the crisis period. And what we do is we're sort of the soldiers that collectivize and go to battle to make change. And so we're very strong collectivists. We flirt with totalitarianism or socialism. Um, and you can see this in the 30s as well. Um, young people at the time unanimously supported FDR, wanted massive changes. This created things like pension, social security, um, things like that. Uh, which were unthinkable before. And then that led into Bretton Woods, which redid the whole financial system, UN, NATO, um, Bretton Woods, all these different things. And so how I would see that is um, you can't really predict things super specifically, but you're just looking at these trends. Millennials are increasing civic engagement. Um, and so what, what influence do young collectivists who now want to participate in the political process, what will that lead to over the next decade? Those are the type of, uh, that's how far zoomed in you can go, in my opinion. And so you can't predict things specifically, but you do get a sense of the mood and how society will respond to certain catalysts, which brings me to technology. And that's probably the most common question I get is, well, the internet, doesn't that change it? Or won't Bitcoin break the cycle? And that was my initial, when I quickly read through the book the first time, I was like, well, Bitcoin is so important, it's going to just blow through this. And I think that was a mistake. And the reason is, um, in the last 500 years, we've seen these cycles play out. And that's a lot of different technological change in the last 500 years. And the cycles still repeat. And so, okay, that's interesting. Why is that? And I go a little bit deeper. And what, what appears to happen is this cycle is a embedded trend or pattern that's repeatable in human society. For whatever reason, it shouldn't exist, but it does. And I think it comes from these very human things like, um, and the phrase from the book is history creates generations, generations create history. And what that means is if we're all born at the same time, we roughly have the same upbringing, the same uh, period is imprinted on our, on our young selves. And then we develop in this thing and we become kind of a well-defined uh, generation. Obviously, individuals are hard to predict, but as a generation, millennials, Gen X, boomers, etc., we do follow these, these uh, stereotypical characteristics that we can observe. And so that if that's true, that the timing imprints the generation, then it's also probably true that when those people grow up, they're going to act sort of all the same because they were influenced younger. So then when they get older, that's just the generation's changing history. And so that cycle is really all it takes. And another interesting thing is it's based on these 80 to 90 year cycles, which is one human life. And so nobody goes to total war. Nobody wants to start total war if they survived the last one because it was horrible. And so right when all the previous people die who experienced World War II are gone, now all of a sudden war starts being popular again. And so I, th I think that's just sort of the, the human cycle. We uh, we just fall trapped to it. We're not as smart as we think we are um, as a society level. And these cause these consequences. So I believe that the d demographics and the archetypes that emerge through that is embedded in human culture. And any technology is simply a, is a response or it's driven by the mood of these emergent demographic trends. So for example, Facebook. 
Facebook was crazy at the time. Hey, put yourself on the internet and we can talk. Like nobody wants to date online. Nobody wants to share their real information online because what about the bad people? And Gen Xers would find Facebook repulsive and boomers in the beginning. Uh, but millennials are collectivists. We want to be out in public and be together and, and we're not, we're not going to hide anything. And so Zuckerberg and a rising tide of millennials coming of age during this period, they made Facebook happen. And that actually changed culture. Um, and we adopted it. But if, if a Gen Xer tried to create Facebook, it would fail. And so that's kind of an interesting example of the demographics demanding or at least allowing technological change to flourish versus be squished out. Yeah, that's how I'd answer. Wow. Um, so, Bren, I mean, you you talked about, um, you know, the thing is, uh, there was a survey, I think, done in the United States where the people were asked, like, how likely would they expect a civil war? And I think a substantial number of people, was it like 37 or 40 percent said, like, uh, civil war is likely. And you, you know, you, uh, if I may quote you out of your article, you said, uh, I mean, I always thought, and if you ask like a lot of people, especially, you know, in Bitcoin community, they always say, you know, it's not going to be frictionless, you know, but what Bitcoin could, you know, has the potential to make it as smooth and peaceful as possible or, or you know, sort of a smooth transition. It's it's about all about tr transition. And you said in your article, you said, uh, you, you know, you talked about the, you know, the, the boomers and the, you know, the... Uh, pension liabilities, and it's crazy. I mean, it's just, you know, actually with all the derivatives and unfunded liabilities, we're talking actually about two quadrillion, but that's you know, another story. And then you talk about, you know, Fed's balance sheet, it could be like 40, 50 trillion dollars by 2030. And then I'm going to quote you, you said, expect more civil wars, hyperinflation events, deadly totalitarianism, and regional conflicts. Smart nations will start monetizing energy assets by missing uh, I'm sorry, by mining Bitcoin and eventually uh, uh, buying it outright. Uh, now, is that something you think um, you, in, within that framework could play out? Like, or, or uh, what is like, what is your, what's your vision? Yeah, so a couple of things tied up. One, we're at the end of the cycle and we haven't had this large climatic event which we respond to by rallying together and make change. So, for example, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. The next day we go to war. The whole country rallies around this single purpose and it's very easy to make change because we're all together. And then as soon as World War II ends, well, Bretton Woods is in 45, World War II ends officially in 95 or 45. And then we re-architect society really quickly. And then pretty much we're set in stone for the next 50 years, more or less. And so I think we're at that same period now. We're about to make massive wide sweeping changes and we haven't had a big enough catalyst to collectivize people enough to actually agree on a vision of the future. And so that's where I see a potential civil war coming. Now, it could be a total war. We could go to war with China. It could be a, a serious thing like that. Or it could be some other type of conflict. But um, after going through the cycles, it seems like civil war is the most likely climax for America right now. Uh, we, we've never seen uh, divides between rural and urban, um, the haves and the have-nots, the political class and the normal people. And so there's all these tension points that are increasing and increasing. And I think COVID actually is making it worse. And we have uh, even more inequality. And so interestingly, financial problems do not solve inequality, like the 2008 financial collapse or 1929. All those do is they temporarily shock the system and then the wealthy, smart, connected, privileged people, they rebound faster and they end up better off financially than they were pre-financial collapse. And that's what we saw in 08. And that's what we're seeing right now in 2020. All the small businesses are in ruin. The big businesses can buddy up with the government, get a special treatment, and now they absorb all the business of those small uh, businesses that they used to serve. And so it's not going to be good for equality, again, bubbling up. And you mentioned some data. Yeah, I think it was like 25% of people are would say that they would support their state seceding from the U.S. Um, and then another one, I think it was 33%. Don't quote me exactly or, or look it up. But there's a stat that says I think 33% of people say that they're willing to uh, accept violence as long as their political party uh, achieves control. And so that's a very, very serious problem, right? We, we view the other side politically as the enemy. 
and we dehumanize them. And those are the first steps towards war. All nation states, before they know they're going to battle, they have to convince their own population that the bad guys are evil. And you're not like them. We have to go vanquish evil. Uh, we can think of them as rats. We can think of them as evil, whatever. But that's the type of psychological environment needed in order to convince a bunch of people to go send their young boys overseas to die and women, of course. Um, and so that's what it feels like we're heading towards. And I don't know for sure. I hope it's not true, but it feels like we're trending that way. Um, next question people always say is, well, the civil, the first American Civil War was clearly defined uh, objectives, right? And I don't think there's going to be anything like that. I, I'm viewing this more as a, a fragmented, confusing fog of war, lots of different factions like separatists and like I think Occupy Wall Street mixed with Antifa, think like Proud Boys mixed with like separatists, defend your land type people. And then you have the state kind of reacting but undermanned and, and not really able to manage the massive land open spaces in the US. And so I, I, I see this confusing, frustrating thing. You don't really know what's what. And I hope it doesn't happen, but that's what it looks like we're trending towards. Next thing is the financial system. So it seems like the financial system is about to break and all the signals are pointing to this, right? We've hit the zero bound of the interest rates uh, from central banks. They have incredible debt. We're printing incredible amounts of new money. And all of, all of our leaders, quote leaders of this fiat Keynesianism world would are saying things like the Great Reset, Bretton Woods 2.0, uh, Build Back Better. And so all the central banks are saying the same thing, that the bank's broken. And don't worry, the big, you know, your, your fearless, godlike leader, central bankers will save you from the crisis. And so they're admitting those problems. And during this period, luckily, we had this beautiful democratizing force called Bitcoin, born at the dawn of the fourth turning in 09, right during the global financial crisis, almost as if it was a response to the problems created by central banking. And so now we get to see Bitcoin growing up and it's going to be tested now when we actually need it. I would argue that prior to 2020, Bitcoin was needed uh, almost, it wasn't needed at all for U.S. citizens or Western Europe, Europeans. However, yeah, you could say it was needed for, for countries with relatively weak currencies or people who need to um, use the censorship resistant properties or seizure resistant properties because of their poor governments. Um, however, in 2020, I would argue that uh, due to all these factors we recently mentioned, that Bitcoin's actually needed for the world. And you're starting to see people wake up to this. You know, you've got the Michael Saylors of the world, you've got the banks participating in the PayPal's, etc. And so everyone's starting to realize that, wow, Bitcoin's really useful in this condition. There's nowhere else to put my money. And so I see a decade of Bitcoin rising juxtaposed with the central bankers trying to double down on their control and their, their top down view of the economy, which obviously does not work. Economies are complex adaptive systems and the big eggheads with their fancy models try to turn this complex system into these static base models, which are laughably uh, inaccurate. But, you know, they think they're smart, so they think they can manage the economy as long as we just have more control of more data. And I, I just reject that premise. And I think it's better for humanity to um, see a market for what it is and empower the market through a free market for money. And I think that that just allows coordination to improve. It's a more fair system. People can save uh, the fruits of their labor, et cetera. And we can go down the case for Bitcoin, but essentially we have a failing system, uh, the society crumbling and demanding new strong institutions to replace healthcare, replace education, to fix government, fix economic inequality, all those things. So we need a strong institution to fix the social side and the economic side. And here's Bitcoin. People are rallying around it. It's a sturdy, strong institution built for a thousand years and it's coming in at the perfect time. And so I don't think we need a financial collapse, uh, a great financial collapse, and I don't think we need total war. We just need Bitcoin to continue chugging along and people will slowly opt out of that system. And we have this pressure release valve that is Bitcoin and we just want to get the right people on the boat. And hopefully that will prevent some sort of uh, massive bloodshed. Do you see this acceleration like happening 
like do you have do you see this coming like is this quiet before the storm you know you, you just mentioned you know these institutions they're important they're totally important i think in this whole game uh but i i i i have the impression it's going to happen and, and there's it's not only my opinion but i think the 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 perception or the thoughts opinions of other you know leading commentators or or institutional you know macro investors or, or what have you um and what I was also going to mention, um, let me let me get my notes. Is that you talked about like okay, we're going to talk about the solutions, you know, that people now finally get it, you know, whether it's about the self sovereignties, you know, going into the hard and scarce money, saving, um, uh, you know, maybe a second or third passport uh, that that could be available to to people, you know, jurisdictional arbitrage. So I want to you know have your take on that. But before we do that, you know, you mentioned uh, and this is what really concerns concerns me and I talk with my girlfriends about this often is that I mean it has always you know the power structures have always been always been centralized you know we, but it just right now it seems like in our faces it's like you know the militarization of the police uh, I mean the whole you know military industrial intelligence complex the governmental complex in collusion with the central banks uh, um, what else uh, you mentioned, you know, increasing surveillance technology, attacks against encryption, uh, un un unmarked paramilitary troops occupying hot zones, and so much more. It, do you, are you sometimes not concerned that it's just, it just being a little bit overwhelming? Because uh, I'm just going to play the devil's advocate here, but is Bitcoin really help us, like free us from these super like technocratic militarized police you know uh, Aurelian surveillance <laughs> apparatus yeah totally I think I think you bring up a couple good points there one centralization um, that is what we're doing right now the whole world is centralizing power and on one hand this is absolutely terrifying I don't think the government should be allocating capital I don't think they should be telling us what to do legislating morality none of these things I don't think that's the role of government however the mood is right now that young people and uh, many people I think it's popular to have a strong government right now and so that's led by the young collectivist hero archetypes the Millennials and the Gen Z, they're also on the si same side, but they're not quite old enough to really make a difference yet um, in terms of civic engagement. And so the mood is centralized because we know things are bad. We know the institutions are bad. And the millennials instinct is, well, if it's bad, we just have to give more power to that. We got to get our leader in power and then our leader will be good and righteous and just and they'll fix everything for us. And that's just not true. However, that is the, the perspective of the young people, right? And what's interesting here, just to take a slight detour, is that each of these archetypes, they, they have their own strengths and weaknesses. So I'm sort of picking on the millennials. And the only reason is because they're the ones who are um, taking the limelight right now. They're driving culture and they have a tendency to collectivize. But if that goes too far, we go into socialism, communism type dystopian uh, future. And so I'm trying to keep the millennials uh, a little bit closer to reality, which is that we do need markets, right? We can't just give all the power to the state. And then you have the opposite people, which are the uh, baby boomers. They're strong individualists and they don't want the government to tell them what to do and they're going to do whatever they want, right? And so if if the, how can I describe this? So if the millennials get too strong in a society, the hero archetype gets too strong in a society, what happens is you get Nazi Germany. Too much order, too much centralization of power, right? Now, if the baby boomers take over, which is the profit archetype, the individualists, then you get the, the consciousness revolution, you get hippie communes, and you get free love and drop out, drop out of society, right? And so both of those are good forces when they're mediated by the other forces, but you just don't want any of those forces to get out of control. And so I see the four archetypes that go in this repeating pattern, just sort of keeping society in bounds so we don't get too imbalanced. And right now, yes, the millennials are going to centralize. And then I see Bitcoin as a, a decentralizing force or a uh, individual a sovereignty force sort of pushing against this centralization. And so theoretically, Bitcoin prevents socialism and communism because we have this, this capitalist market-based monetary system, which spills over into society, which allows the people who want free markets to go there. And if Bitcoin continues its, its dominance, gobbling up assets, gobbling up intellectual capital, 
and developers and infiltrating uh, the, the businesses and, and the governments, pretty soon it's going to be powerful enough that it's going to be siphoning away the collectivists. And I think that's really, really important here. It's sort of, it's a check on that. And another question, like, is it scary or overwhelming right now? Yes, absolutely. If I didn't have uh, a grasp on Bitcoin and, and Bitcoin gives me hope, if I didn't have that, I would be very scared, very overwhelmed. I don't, I don't know. I honestly, it's hard. I, I can't really picture what I would be doing right now, but I would be very concerned. Um, and so I used to have a lot of energy to put into the political system. Um, for the last five, 10 years, I've wanted to change the system. Then finding Bitcoin, I realized that I don't need to try to save this dying system from the inside. Instead, let's build a parallel system. And then you come to Bitcoin and you realize, wow, there's a bunch of other people like me who are disenchanted with the system. And instead of trying to fix it, which I don't believe is possible, we're building this other thing. And you find all these, these brothers in arms and sisters in arms on a new mission. And so that's what gives me hope and optimism, because I think that this thing is built for a thousand years. And if we do rally around it, I think it, it's the perfect antidote to some of the madness we're experiencing right now. And is Bitcoin perfect? No. Is there, is there still going to be conflict and tyranny with Bitcoin? Of course. But it is a trend in the right direction. And if we zoom out one more step, I think it's humanity's goal. I think humanity's goal should be to grow at 1% a year, compounding forever rather than have these aggressive peaks and troughs that cause all these, these chaos, all this chaos. And I think Bitcoin is actually a perfect stabilizing force for society. And so I think that the economic trends will be a little bit more smoothed out. I think it'll be just more steady, predictable, uh, strong, resilient, robust growth instead of these blow off tops and uh, where we risk catastrophic failure each time. Yeah, you can say blow off tops, bring in new capital and they spur innovation. And that's true, but they come at a very high cost. And I would rather us grow slower and steadier and, and more resilient than uh, pull demand forward with fiat economics and risk catastrophe. Yeah, and totally agree with you, by the way, you just made, you know, you just said that if, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, I mean, I would be probably highly depressive, or, you know, no, no hope, no vision, no, you know, nothing. I mean, you know, no real picture in my head, like how, how can evolution happen now? Now, you know, and probably, you know, you, I know, you know, Jeff Booth and I had talks together, you know, on a panel with uh, Titus Gable, you know, of Free Private Cities. Um, and, and Jeff Booth, and also with Grant Romond, the ocean builder, um, is this like uh, is this a topic in the book, or 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 have you thought about it? Is that like a exit uh, thing where people are gonna go and just create, as you said? You know, we don't need to fight the system; we just need to create these new structures. Uh, and 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 what I'm I'm really hoping is that you know when Jeff Wood you know talks about deflationary economics or exponential technologies, or we you know we talk about Peter Thiel zero to one. I mean, I'm hoping that there are more not only you know within the AI computing information, you know, Bitcoin, but like on the structural uh, level, like energy, energy production, energy conversion, environmental uh, transportation technology, you know, I mean, we haven't had really a new besides combustion engines or, you know, or jet engines, we haven't had any other technologies, which makes me really, I mean, baffled uh, in the last, especially in the last hundred years. Um, is, do, do you see something like coming like that, that can like structurally uh, bring us up without like, you know, uh, disrupting this transition process uh, too much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bring up some good points there. First, Jeff Booth's amazing. I'm really glad he's on Team Bitcoin. Um, he's very well spoken. And I think it's important that he's banging the drum about um, deflationary money. I think that that needs to be in the consciousness because for some reason, deflation has this, it has a negative connotation. And maybe we could say that that's fiat propaganda or maybe it's just an accident of a system. Um, however it comes in, I'm glad Jeff's doing what he's doing. Um, you bring up things like free cities and maybe uh, building on the ocean or something like that. And I think that's an interesting model. I think the sovereign individual is probably the best lens to view that where essentially the nation state no longer has the uh, advantage in the information age because uh, having a large state is really expensive and the, the logic of violence shifts towards defense being easier than offense. And so if that's true, 
we could see a flourishing of new city states and new experiments in government, whether that's in uh, physical locations, you could say like Singapore or Hong Kong um, are sort of like startup nations relative to our older nations. Um, I think that's very possible. I think another option is that we create digital nations first. And you can kind of already see that geography is less important. Bitcoiners online are talking about citadels. And what if a citadel is just an online community? And maybe sometime in the future, we acquire land. Once we have enough political will and enough economic power, we can negotiate with these failed states and say, hey, why don't you sell us Colorado or we'll take this, Texas is now for Bitcoin or whatever. Um, so I think that's, I think that conversation is, uh, we're a little early for that conversation, but I think in the next 50 years, we'll see tremendous fraction of these mega states. Um, but I'm not as, uh, I don't think it's gonna be as quick as some Bitcoiners think. Um, and then you mentioned some things about um, a renaissance and a potential future that's better than today. And you mentioned Peter Thiel. And Peter Thiel has a thesis that the last 50 years, we've done pretty much nothing. Like all the big innovations came before that. And I think that's actually a really interesting counterintuitive point. And the average person would say, well, no, a lot of things have changed in my lifetime. Sure, yes, we have mobile, we have social, we have the internet, we have these things, we have pretty much the last 10 years, we put all our smart people to build surveillance technology and ad tech and social media platforms. And so is that really useful innovation for humanity? Or is that just like a temporary pause in our progress? And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to Peter Thiel here. Um, I initially heard his thesis and I resisted it, but the more I thought about it, we're not making any big advancements in society. We're kind of stagnating. And so, could that be because we have so much debt, we're at the end of the fourth turning, or could it be some other reason? I'm not exactly sure, but I think what's interesting with Bitcoin and the fourth turning is that what ends up happening is you take power away from the old and you give it to the new. And so the game board sort of gets tilted towards young people. And that's important because young people are the innovators. They have all the energy and they see the future and they're willing to shoot the moon in an attempt to go get it. They foolishly try to shoot the moon. Most fail, but the ones who succeed change the future for everyone. And so we need young people to have more of a role in society. We need to get rid of their debt. We need to give them a fair economic prospects so that then they can go create and make the world better for everyone. And so I do see a brighter future where um, Bitcoin is a monetary standard that we use. It's, it's part of the wealth transfer towards the young people. Uh, the creditors get screwed, the debtors, AKA the young people are an advantage. And that's gonna be massive if that occurs. And Brady put a name to this with the Bitcoin Renaissance. I think that that's a really nice framing. And if that's true, let's say in a decade or now, we'll, we'll be, um, Bitcoin will have its place in the financial system, we'll be through the fourth turning, we'll be rebuilding. And if we are on a sound money standard, I think it's going to have profound impacts on the economy and the prosperity. So all of a sudden we have this money that connects everyone in the world. Geographic borders are irrelevant. This means you can hire a web developer from Iran without the U.S. government attacking you for it. You can have someone who has great skills in Africa, but they can't find capital. We can now merge them with capital globally and allow their creative output to be realized. And so it sort of unlocks latent human potential that's being burdened by an old financial system. And I don't think it was the grand conspiracy. I just think that we're bolting on, <clears throat> we're trying to make these incremental changes to an old system. And instead we just sort of need a system that was designed for the information age instead of a system designed before that. And so I could see a lot of old institutions that were pre-internet founded, struggling to make this transition to an internet based world. And I think that's kind of, uh, to take another slight tangent, I think that's kind of what we're experiencing here is uh, the internet is just getting started and the whole world just got accelerated onto it, the internet due to COVID. We saw the boomers discover video conferencing for the first time and we're seeing online shopping rises and malls dying and social things going online and VR and all these things. So humanity is essentially grappling with this transition and COVID just accelerated it. And so now we're feeling the growing pains of becoming a digital nation or a digital society. And that's gonna have all kinds of consequences. And I think part of humans 
um, downfall is our arrogance, our hubris. We think that our big brains can solve any problem. And we are good at that. We are the best life form at doing that uh, to the best of our knowledge. And so that gives us this, this confidence, but it also gives us some overconfidence in a sense that uh, many people think we can just upload our consciousness to the internet and we can just be this network digital species. Many people think we can stare at a device all day and we don't have to be in nature. We don't have to take care of our physical body. And so it seems like society is living in our heads and in our intellectual capacity and we're neglecting our bodies. And you see this showing up in things like depression and poor health and, and uh, ADD brains and all this stuff. And so I think what we need to realize is that our monkey suit, our meat suit needs to be uh, tended to. And that's going for walks, disconnecting, human connection, physical exercise, all these things that our body developed uh, through our evolutionary history, which was in small hunter-gatherer gatherer tribes, 150 person groups, exercise every day outside, find your own food, low stress. And so that's what we're built for. And now we're putting ourselves in this wholly foreign environment and that has all these consequences. And so as we become a digital species, which I think is inevitable, I just hope that we keep an eye on our bodies. And you, you've seen probably this, this future, uh, not cypherpunk, but solar punk. And I'm not super deep in this. It's essentially a future vision that merges high tech society with nature. The, the, the images are like beautiful, super advanced cities with like food growing right on the outside of the buildings. And our communal spaces are technologically enabled, but there's trees and plants everywhere. And so I, I don't know enough about that vision, but to me, that makes the most sense. We can't neglect our body as far as I know, and we're going to become a network species because it provides all these amazing tools. But if we neglect our body, we're going to pay the consequence. And so let, let's build a solar punk future. I'm, I'm totally with you on that. Um, so, Brandon, I mean, um, you know, I want to wrap this up. I mean, I have I have time, but I don't want to take up too much time of yours. Uh, Brandon, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, maybe maybe my conviction is is too strong or I may, maybe it might, might be too optimistic. What I wish is that people understand like the it is not utopian to think, you know, we can, we, uh, do you think the brainwashing, the indoctrination of people's minds, you know, of, 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 of children's minds of, you know, the young people has been, has been progressed like so far with the, you know, social media or, or you know, media or, or uh, school or universities or the whole system that we can't even like fathom. We can't even imagine that we can't, we do have like Jeff Booth says, you know, uh, we 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 can have like a a future where where we can prosper in abundance and prosperity, and we can you know we will pay less and less. This is what Bitcoin is all about. Like it's a deflationary economics, uh, deflationary money where we would pay less and less for better and more innovative products and services, and where you know totally new technological innovation would 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 emerge, and and thrive. Uh, so this is you know. Um, do you think we are we are on a consciousness level, on a consciousness level, or a comprehension intelligence level? Do you think this is also part of the evolution of the of this uh, paradigm shift or or of the fourth turning? Yeah, um, interesting point. So first, to touch on schools and yeah, social media and young people. So I, I think what's happening now is we've noticed that our education system is pretty bad. And we notice our healthcare system, especially in the U.S., is pretty bad. We notice our politics is pretty bad. And so we sort of outgrew all these institutions that we built a very long time ago. And so I expect massive changes from these systems. And you see the type of people who are pushing back at our education and they're saying, well, it feels like brainwashing. It's not that good. What are we doing here? I don't want my kid learning these things. And you can kind of see that the popular culture is in from that perspective popular culture which is collectivist populist socialist leaning that's sort of uh as you said brainwashing young people it sort of perverted the curriculum in a sense and that's that's partially true but i would point to the fact that these education institutions the state education that was never supposed to give you a great free thinking critical thinking li classically liberal education these were more or less daycare institutions or uh, obedience school training for an industrial era, 
right? And so the foundation of these things were never built like that. And so I think we're just sort of realizing that they don't serve us anymore. And we're sort of fighting that system. And some people want to say, well, we just have to fix the curriculum. And, you know, the, the conservative people would say we need more religion in schools. The other people would say we need on the, on the left would say we need less religion in school. And I think all of those ideas don't matter because the system we have now is going to be irrelevant. And I don't know exactly what the future of education will be, but it's not what we're doing right now. And so I wouldn't waste any more energy trying to fix the old system if you're the type of person who has young people or you're concerned about this. Instead, look to the future. What, is, what do you want education to be? Because we have an opportunity now to completely start over. And this, this might be some sort of homeschooled um, type training, or maybe it's small neighborhoods where each kid, maybe there's 10 families and one day a week, the kids go to a different person's house for social time and then they learn through their computer. And I'm not sure what the future looks like, but forget the old stuff, build new. And to me, that's very optimistic. I'm super passionate about education uh, and learning in general. And so I would say after Bitcoin is boring, let's say let's say we, we get Bitcoin to a point where we're not needed as much, it's not that exciting, it's just money now, then I think education would be a place I could see myself spending time. Um, and so, yeah, I, I haven't thought enough about this because I think it's a, the next thing that I care about. But yeah, I guess my too long didn't read is don't worry about the old one and build a new one. Great. Um, well, Brandon, thank you so much. You know, I love your work. Uh, is there anything coming up? Uh, you Are you planning to write another like on different subjects, different topics? Is there anything coming up? Where can people find you? Any Anything I left out maybe important? Yeah, so... Uh, the fourth turning essay was uh, took a lot out of me. I, I did a lot of historical research and the editing process was grueling and I like to make things as good as I can. So I spent a lot of time there and I'll probably take a little breather from publishing for now. Um, I spend a lot of time with Swan and I write a lot for Swan. And so I'm still flexing my writing muscle, but I don't think I'll take on any big projects right now. Maybe Maybe in the Q1 next year, I'll start writing again. But I do have unlimited ideas. Um, that's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin and being exposed to all these smart people is that just passively observing Bitcoin and doing some reading on the side, I have unlimited ideas from all these smart people smashing things together. So yeah, I'll continue writing, but I'll probably take a quick breather. Um, once I get bored of talking about the fourth turning, then I'll start writing again. That's probably what will happen. And you can find me on Twitter or on my website, brandingquidum.com. Um, but I, I love interacting with you guys and I've learned so much from other Bitcoiners. So if any of this resonates with you, come say hello. Uh, on Twitter, it's bquidum, B-Q-U-I-T-T-E-M. And otherwise, come say hello to the SWAN team. Um, and if you want to start auto stacking, auto DCA in the United States, you can go to swanbitcoin.com slash quidum. And if you sign up with that, you'll get $10 worth of free Bitcoin. And we're, we're sort of the, the onboarding platform. You know, if you have a, a friend who wants to get into Bitcoin and you don't want them to get into shit coins, uh, just send them to Swan. We'll take care of them. And our product is based on auto DCA. So you say, I want to buy $100 a week or $500 a month or whatever you want to do. Connect your bank, hit go, and it auto automates everything for you. Um, I think that's the right approach for most people to acquire Bitcoin. Um, now, however, we're in a bull market. And so you might have someone say, hey, well, I let's say I want to buy $10,000 of the Bitcoin. Should I buy it today or should I do $1,000 a month? And during the bull market, it might be advisable actually to dump a lot in now rather than DCA. And so in response to that demand, Swan added wires. So now all the Swan customers can wire money to Swan and, and make one-time buys. And we're also adding instant ACH or, or buy now, I should say. So you can just send money through ACH. And so, yeah, we're going to have the buy now. We're going to have the wires and we have the auto DCA. And so, um, yeah, we'll take your, your, no, your no coiners. We have the lowest fees in the U.S. for the service, uh, 60 to 80% lower than Swan. Or, or sorry, then Coinbase, and you can auto withdraw. And so it's built for Bitcoiners, but it's also simple and safe for no coiners or new coiners. And so, yeah, come over to Swan and we'd love to onboard you. Yeah, definitely. It's a beautiful product because you, know, you can just be relieved and just go to sleep and it you know does the work for you. And you don't have to worry about anything. One final question, where do you see, you know, all people always, you know, do all kinds of price estimates. But the thing is, like, just for the final you know thing is that, um, even if we say like whatever, half a million, one million, but it, 
are we by then, you know, in five to 10 years time, are we really going to think in fiat denominated terms? Because it's about the purchasing power. Like, like, uh, like, what do you, where, where do you see Bitcoin? I mean, going or, or in, in terms of purchasing power in five to 10 years? Yeah, that's, that's a hard question, right? The future is, is, you know, I can look in the long future and see Bitcoin being the dominant money and dominant store of value and being massive. But how we get there at the five year mark or the seven year mark or whatever, that's always tricky. Um, but how I would answer this question is in 2019, I would have said 100,000 to, you know, $100,000 Bitcoin in 2021 would have been great. Um, however, in 2020, I think what happened was it accelerated Bitcoin's adoption cycle because it became needed and, as a store of value. And so the whole world digested the store of value thesis. And now you have, excuse me, large capital allocators entering the space. And you also at the same time have a, a failing financial system. So the environment around Bitcoin just got way worse. And so the difference between 2017 and 2020 is now everyone realizes they need Bitcoin and everyone realizes that the narrative is a store of value. In 2017, it was like a bridge currency about blockchain and whatever. Um, now the narrative is pretty refined and it's, it's potent. And so I could see the next year or two um, going way higher than 100,000. Now, it's impossible to make these guesses because during the exponential parabolic phase, we're going to overshoot the mean a bit. Um, and so I, it's hard to put numbers to it, but I think that we're going to have a two, three years, maybe, maybe up to five years where the dollar stays relevant. And then if we go into these central bank digital currencies, we're going to have to deflate away our debt. And so no matter what currency devaluation is coming, now, the only question is, is it going to be a slow, gradual transition or will the dollar eventually hyperinflate? I don't know. Um, I see small nations hyperinflating. I don't see the dollar. I, I think the dollar will be last to fall if it if it collapses. Um, and so it's hard to say. But in terms of purchasing power, I think Bitcoin will decimate gold slowly over time. I think it will take money out of equities. It'll take money out of real estate. It'll take money out of uh, negative yielding bonds. So there's all these low hanging fruit for for Bitcoin to suck up value. Um, I can't put a number on it. Hundreds of thousands next year would be my guess. In five to 10 years, in today's money, at least 500,000, uh, potentially more is what I would say. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with you. Well, Brandon, it was really enjoyed uh, this talk. I uh, hope we can repeat this in next year, maybe in a panel discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up your you know brilliant work and yeah, all the best to you. Talk to you soon, all right? <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Wonderful conversation. Have a good rest of your night. You too. Bye bye. All right. How'd you like this awesome cosmic conversation? Brand is always, you know, a really enlightening mind and and inspiring and and so knowledgeable. So make sure you follow him on on on, on Twitter and his website is brandonquitum.com. Read his fascinating articles. Make sure please subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. Leave me some kind of any if you loved any of those interviews i've done please leave a five-star review on any podcast platform would it be on spotify itunes what have you on all those podcast platforms that would really help me you know uh, push forward the algorithms so i can you know be shown up and you know so i can share more of these educational materials and content which i've been doing for more than two or three years actually bitcoin only so my name is Kevin Davani. I'm the Total Connector. And if you have any wishes or comments or questions or you know any special guests you want you want me to bring on, uh, leave me you know uh, a DM or uh, email hello at thetotalconnector.com. Thank you so much for support. Thanks so much for listening. Like it, share it, retweet it. And if you want to support me in any shape or form, you're welcome. And all right, have a good day, and I'll see you soon again. Bye.